So first of all, thank you. I don't see anybody getting up and running from the room screaming <laughs> when you see me here instead of Hillary. Uh, how many of you know Hillary? I know she's local out here, so you have to give her a good report that I did a good job tonight. Um, <laughs> So first of all, her apologies that she can't be here with you. There was some uh, confusion about scheduling. She had this on her calendar for Sunday, and when the dates finally got rearranged to Friday night, uh, she was not able to make it. So you have to put up with me. It's interesting, this is the first time I've been on a program with someone who's gonna speak with you about seismic events, although that's something that I have a very strong interest in as well because with the incident management teams that we have here in the Northwest that respond to wildfire, we're actually all hazard teams. So we go to the Southeast to do hurricanes, uh, challenger recovery, uh, WTO in Seattle, 9-11 uh, in New York. So uh, a lot of different ways that we get involved and when that magnitude nine earthquake happens, hopefully way after my lifetime, uh, people on our management teams will, will be uh, really involved in that. So I want to do about four things tonight. All right, you guys are, are doing a great job in that you're a west side community that's starting to pay attention to wildfire. I'm going to give you some information that will show you why that's such a good decision, why that's so important to you, and I, I think I'll show you some things, <clears throat> excuse me, that'll surprise you about wildfire on the west side. I want to talk with you a little bit about what we're doing to prepare for wildfire, both at DNR and on a regional and a national basis with uh, some of those uh, interagency groups that I work with. And then I want to end by showing you some resources that you can utilize to hopefully better prepare your community, your homes for wildfires. And I think we're going to have time at the end for questions. Uh, I think we decided we'd wait till the end of the presentation to do that, and then there'll be some joint time after Aaron speaks as well. So, 1984 to 2016, that shows you where most of the fires have been in Washington. You're going to see, no surprise, east side, um, really not much on the west side. They don't often happen over here. That has kind of tended to give people the view that they won't happen here. You hear a lot of times the west side forest, particularly out on the Olympic Peninsula, talked about as the asbestos forest, like it's never going to burn. <laughs> so if you look, though, historically, over the last 400 years, and you look at where fires have occurred, this is fire activity in western Washington. The black is very infrequent fires, but when they happen, they have a very high severity, all the way down to the more red ones, which when they happen are low severity, but they happen a lot more frequently. You know, in eastern Washington, we have a return interval in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 years for fires. Areas are going to reburn. We don't see that here. Uh, on the east side. What we have over here are our dug fir hemlock forests, and this is kind of the progression that you normally see. And what you see is those forests are normally started by a stand replacement fire. So one of the things that a couple of brilliant young men at my agency have done, um, Josh Kolofsky and Dan Donato, and they're responsible for all of these slides, they've looked and tried to put together the historical record of wildfire in Washington. One of the ways they did that is look at the remaining patches of old growth, and there isn't a ton of it, as you all well know, but it's a pretty safe assumption those stands were started by a stand replacement fire. So if you look at the ages of those stands, that can give you a line on how long ago it's been since those fires occurred. Fires over here normally are very patchy, which is a good thing. You'll have some areas of them that are very high intensity and are complete stand replacement fires. On that same fire, though, you'll have other areas that are very low intensity fires. This um, couple of pictures from the Eagle Creek fire down in the Columbia Gorge uh, three years <coughs> ago. And uh, it's kind of hard to see with the lights up this high, but if, if you had a better look at that, what you would see is that burn is very patchy. Some areas, it uh, completely wipes out the forest. Other areas, though, it basically just underburns the forest, which is actually a good thing. 
So how big were the large fires event over here? Um, Josh and Dan have done simulations, and I think you'll hear a lot about simulations of fires on the west side. And basically, um, in that 870,000 to 2.2 million acres is probably the scope of the significant fires that we've had in the past in both Western Washington and Western Oregon. So some examples, uh, 1,700 out on the Olympic Peninsula. If you remember that slide I showed of the state and the different severity of fires, almost the whole uh, of Olympic National Park in the area on the coast to the west of that was black. That almost all burned in one huge fire that was over two million acres. Um, in that same year, about three to 10 million acres burned in Western Washington. And that's not only from the modeling that Josh and Dan have done, uh, but a Henderson paper written back in 1989 used some different methodology, some different historical records came to very much the same conclusions. 1902, southwest corner of the state, we had the Yakult complex. This was actually a series of fires that occurred, uh, one large fire and then some reburns. But that fire, um, according to the National Interagency Fire S uh, Center in Boise, was again over a million acres. Uh, on the west side. And last, uh, down in Oregon, 1933, we had the Tillamook burn, which was 350,000. Um, so when we see those fires that are 100,000, 200,000 acres on uh, the east side, down in California, we think of how big those are. Imagine the scope of these here on the west side with all of the people that are involved now. So again, um, this map of the different severity of fires and frequency, a lot of the, the information came from looking at land survey records that were done back in the 1900s. Uh, parties of people were out surveying the land, and as they did that, they made notes about the fires that they saw. So if you look at that, the infrequent high severity fires, the largest patch size of those fires from this map are in excess of a million acres in one event. I'm not going to touch that slide. <laughs> so what's happening recently with fires? Um, these two graphs show the yearly average of fires on both the west side and the east side over the last 10 years. And if you look at those lines, um, you'll see that on the east side, that line's almost flat. There's been almost no change in the number of fires and the acres that get burned annually on the east side. But look at the line on the left for the west side. And you see it's been a pretty steady upward climb during that 10 year period. Um, this year to date, we've had 1,145 fires and over 30% of those have been in Western Washington. This is a trend we've really seen build in particularly the last three years. Last year, about 40% of our fires were on the west side. That's actually caused us to make some changes in uh, how we stage our resources that I'll talk about. So what's DNR doing about it? Uh, one thing is um, in past budget cycles, DNR has had a habit of going to the legislature and asking for some really pretty small amounts of money to make some pretty small changes in our resources. Uh, with Hillary's arrival, that changed. And she went to the legislature the last budget cycle and she made a $55 million request of the legislature. And I have to tell you, there probably um, were very few people, even within our own agency, that expected us to get anywhere near that. We were trying to figure out, okay, what will we do if we get half of that? What will we do if we get a quarter of that? As you all know, she got all of it. She's pretty persuasive when, uh, when she starts to work on an issue. So how have we been spending that? Um, How many full-time firefighters do you think we have at DNR? Just shout out a number. Well, that's, that's 
that's new. That's oh. new. How many do you think we have now? Ten. I have less than 50 that are full-time permanent employees that do fire. What we depend on at DNR is, we call it a militia model, where all of the people in our other programs also have fire qualifications. When the fire bell rings, we borrow them. That's hard to do because those people have eight jobs. And trying to borrow them, <clears throat> particularly as fire seasons have gotten longer, used to be fire season was June, July, and August. Uh, now it's March to November, and a lot of times in January, February, December, we have firefighters in other states helping. So we don't even talk about fire seasons anymore, we talk about the fire year. Um, two years ago, I had firefighters in fire camp on Christmas Eve in California. This past year, the first week of March, we had 52 fires here in Washington. And again, 48 of those were in Western Washington. Very, um, very new situation for us to try to deal with. So the money that Hillary got, one of the things we're doing is uh, we are using it to get 30 new full-time firefighters. So it won't quite double the uh, full-time resources, but pretty close to it. We have a dedicated training staff that we're hiring, a small team. Uh, right now, that militia model is also used to present the training that we do. Again, we're using people that have other jobs to try to do that. Uh, we're going to use some of that money to hire a full-time small team that will be just dedicated to presenting training, not just to DNR, but we also train the National Guard. We train a lot of fire district staff, a lot of tribal staff, uh, a lot of uh, federal staff. So all of those are involved in the fire academies that we run. Uh, prevention outreach. We're going to be putting uh, an additional staff person in each of our six regions to work with communities like yours on things that you all can do to prepare for fire season. Um, faster aerial response. We're very dependent on a fleet of helicopters that we control their federal excess property, um, actually old Vietnam era Hueys that our mechanics paint up and make look very pretty. Um, we have nine of those that we control and then we also contract with a small fleet, uh, somewhere six or eight, depending on the year, single engine air tankers. So we're using a part of that budget to add two additional helicopters to our helicopter fleet. And then last, we've made a big realignment in my division. The reason, one of the reasons we're seeing this fire issue is the forced health problem that we've got in Washington. We have a huge amount uh, and it's not just Washington, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Montana, British Columbia, um, millions of acres of dead and dying trees that are making it harder when fires do start for us to do anything about them. Our fire model has been a reactive model. The fire starts, we go try to put it out. We will never catch up and we will never get ahead of what's happening as long as we keep doing that. We've got to get much more proactive. We've got to start dealing with that forest health issue. With all of our forest health programs being in my wildfire division, what that's meant is they get very little attention because I'm paying most attention to the fires. It's more of an emergency response, and the forest health issues get kind of short shrift. We decided to change that, and again, this was under Hillary's leadership and the new state forester, which is the person I report to. And we split all of those forest health programs into a brand new program, have their own division manager, have their own focus. Um, and there is a significant amount of this budget ask that's going to be funding, uh, beefing up that staff and putting a lot of fuels reduction efforts in place. That fuels reduction is going to include a greatly increased use of prescribed fire, intentionally identifying areas where we can put fire back the landscape, um, use that as a method of controlling fuels and that undergrowth and not let the fuels build up. Uh, Smoky Bear has done a great job over the last 100 years. We stopped really aggressively putting out fires. We, or I'm sorry, we stopped letting fires um, do sort of their ecological role. We started aggressively putting them out. The Forest Service, so the Forest Service had a 10 a.m. rule. They wanted every fire put out by 10 a.m. the morning following when it started. And we did a great job at that. 
but that's why we have forests now that you can't walk through um, and that we can't put a fire out in because this is, it's too dangerous a condition for us to put firefighters in. So that's probably the biggest thing that we're doing. So what can you all do? Uh, in the last two years, again, under Hillary's leadership, we've put out two strategic plans. On the right side is a 20-year forest health strategic plan. It's focused primarily right now on eastern Washington, although we're in the process of starting to write um, a forest action plan for western Washington that should be completed by July. Left-hand side, a wildfire protection strategic plan, and uh, that's been released only about four months ago. These things are big, they're heavy. I did not bring copies of them. I brought a couple that I'm gonna leave on the uh, fire district's table. If you're here the next two or three days, you can look at it. I am gonna show you, if you go to that dnr.wild.gov website, you can find those online though. So here are some other things. I was very pleased to see on one of your fire stations as I pulled into town this big sign that the fire district was doing firewise presentations. That's a great source for you. Uh, if you got a cell phone that's got a camera, you feel free to take a picture of that if you want so you've got those websites. Uh, Ready, Set, Go is another program for community and homeowner preparation. Fire adapted communities, uh, the fire adapted community learning network, uh, there are websites about fire-resistant plants that you can put in your landscaping uh, and then a learn how to prepare for wildfire. And again, all of those you can find on our website or you can find links to them through our website. And with that, it's Aaron's turn. Do you want to take questions? Okay, or guys, we'll take a couple of quick, oh, I got to go back. Somebody's not going to have taking pictures. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Charlie, my question is, is there any way for the state to build more reservoirs so that they can collect more rainwater so the fires can be put out quicker? Because we were lucky this past summer, but we were very unlucky the previous at least two summers. So because of drought conditions. The bad yeah. smoke. The smoke was horrifying. So the problem with that smoke, the smoke... The question is what? The question is... Can the state build water reservoirs so that the water could be used to put fires out quicker and help keep the smoke down? The problem is that smoke that's been coming into western Washington isn't coming from Washington. Very rarely is that smoke that comes from here. Last year, uh, the bulk of it was from British Columbia. We also, um, last year, a lot of that smoke was actually coming over the pole and coming from Siberia. So we, um, if you go in and look at the satellite maps when it gets smoky, you can actually see on the maps where that's coming from. Now that's not to say it's never from Washington because sometimes it is. We actually have a pretty good situation in Washington as far as water. Our helicopters, our single engine air tankers, can, and what we use for single engine air tankers are scoopers. And we've got lots of places in Washington we can utilize those. So water is usually not a big problem. Yes, sir. On the, the three great fires that you talked about, one of them is 1700. Prior, was it prior to 1700 or the year 1700? Um, I think what that shows is around 1700. I think when you get that far back, it's hard to nail down the specific year. So I can't tell you anything more than around then. My question is the historical record shows that the year 1700 around the end of January is when the southern end. Mm. The great last great earthquake here. I wonder is there a relationship between seismic activity of the major proportions and the outbreak of major fires? Sounds like a seismic question to me. Yeah. Boy, that's a punch if I ever saw one. Did you pay him to ask? No, I was wondering that myself. <laughs> um, I mean, before Aaron pops up, okay. we, will, we will get to that question. Um, are there any other burning questions. <laughs> I was working on that in the back of the room. I was yeah. writing down puns. I'm going to tell Hillary that you said so. <laughs> um, Yes, here and then there. Is there a pro and con as far as the effect on wildlife for the dead vegetation that's in the forest? Is there a great deal of wildlife? 
there's certainly a very negative uh, impact when we have those huge high severity stand replacing fires. There are large numbers of wildlife that are lost in the fire itself, but you also get extreme habitat loss that comes from that. Um, some of the dead material is actually important to a lot of the wildlife species, but when you get that really high intensity fire, you basically end up with uh, a bunch of black matchsticks standing up out there. The soil is damaged. Um, we get uh, a lot of landslides, first time it rains after it, and all of that can be pretty detrimental to wildlife. Yes, sir? With our in increased awareness of climate change, are there options to prescribe fires that, you know, result in them being less greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Are we exploring things like selective logging or you know, other options? Um, if you take a look at that uh, forest health plan, you're going to see that pres although prescribed fire gets a lot of attention right now, it's really only one tool. There are a lot of mechanical means that can be used, uh, pre-commercial thinnings. Um, you start to run into an uh, interesting conversation, though, because there are those who believe that that conversation is an excuse to increase logging, which some people obviously aren't uh, all that fond of either. But prescribed fire is only one tool in the toolbox. There are a lot of areas we actually will never be able to, to, act, to put prescribed fire on the ground because the fuel load is so high um, that you would end up with one of those high severity fires that you couldn't control. I have a question about the, the PNR have a kind of a ranking of naked uh, shrub level plants that are most hazardous. In other words, like you're trying to create a defensive zone around your home. Do you want to maintain salal and do away with huckleberry? Do you have any ranking of native plants? Not, not landscaping, but native. Um, I think if you look at that fire resistant plant website, it will actually include that as well. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, um, along with that same question, um, is there a discussion somewhere of like, how close all trees should be to houses? Um, again, when you look at things like Fireways USA, uh, when you, the fire district is putting on their programs about that, my guess is they will have some recommendations for you about that. There's been a lot of work done, particularly on the California fires the last couple of years, the Paradise Fire in particular, about what's actually causing those communities uh, to react the way they have. A lot of it does have with construction. A lot of it has to do with the venting of your houses, the vents up under the eaves, the vents down going into the crawl spaces. If the uh, the mesh size on those is too large. Um, that can be very, that can greatly increase the opportunity for fire to start. One of the, th I'll leave you with one thing. So we actually had, uh, mentioning paradise, made me think of this. You all are doing a great job educating yourselves about this. Our agency got a series of emails from another state agency about two weeks ago. And the staff of that agency had been asked by their director to come to DNR and get information that would allow them to put out a message of why a paradise type fire cannot happen in Washington. And my boss and I and Hillary had to tell them, sorry, uh, but it can. There are actually evaluations that have been done of the towns in Washington that kind of rank where that kind of situation could happen. And you're looking at things like limited ingress and egress out of an area, uh, how close the forest is, whether there's been any fireways work done around the community. And Leavenworth tops that list. And any of you that have been to Leavenworth know what a beautiful town that would be, uh, that is, and what a tragedy that would be. So um, those kind of things can happen here. I'm sorry? It is. Um, I'll find that uh, before you leave. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.